obviously spent a number of years uh, serving under Chief Justice Wilentz, and then you were uh, spending uh, not quite as many years, but a good number of years under just Chief Justice uh, Poritz. Any any uh, comments on uh, differences in style, or did it seem pretty much like a continuity of uh, of uh, practice? Uh, uh, they were different people, and so there there were differences. Uh, one of Robert Wilentz's most striking characteristics was the intensity that he brought to his work. Uh, Chief Justice Poritz uh, had a, I would say, a, a kinder, gentler approach. And, uh, they both were excellent Chief Justices, and I en enjoyed working with both of them. But there were no major differences in, in uh, the way they approached the work of the court? I, I, I would focus more on the similarities than on the differences. I, I'm sure there were differences, uh, but uh, I, I think each was committed to uh, preserving the court uh, and its reputation. Mm. Uh, you mentioned Chief Justice Wilentz's intensity. Can you, can you, uh, we just come up in, in other interviews. Uh, any examples spring to mind? <clears throat> None spring to mind, <laughs> but I know they're there. Mm. Uh, he, he, he was a very intense person, mm -hmm. and he, uh, he had two major problems while he was on the court, but because of his self-discipline, they, they did not affect his performance. One was the tragic death of his wife, and the other was his own declining health. Uh, but Robert was committed uh, to uh, to discharging his responsibilities, notwithstanding those tragedies. Uh, in yesterday's interview, you talked about um, going to visit the prisons with uh, yes. Chief Justice Hughes. Uh, were there any uh, sort of you know actions that either of the other Chief Justices you worked under uh, tried to you know do things like that uh, expose? Judges to different uh, aspects of the operation, or uh, I just don't know. Okay. All right. Um, again, let me uh, refer to my list. Uh, the next case I want to uh, talk about um, is uh, the um, Oh, Invaldi uh, versus Invaldi case. Yes. Yes. Tell me uh, a little bit about that. Well, that that was an unusual case. It's interesting. By the time that came to the court, I I was a, I had developed sufficient um, efficiency. I was able to get that out in very short order. I think I think that I think if you look at the date between the the dates between the date of argument and the date of decision it was only a couple of weeks hmm. but what it what it raised was the application of the uniform child custody jurisdiction act to parents who lived not in different states but in different countries hmm. and we held that the word state in that act included a foreign country so that the test that was applied to determine wh what substantive law should apply uh, would, would be the same uh, as if the parties lived in different states in the United States and not in different countries. And the intriguing part about it was that there are an increasing number of couples who live in different countries and it's just part of uh, 
the, I guess, the globalization of, of life. Uh, and so that's what, that's what that case stood for. And uh, I, I, again, I think there have been changes in the law since I wrote the opinion. I'm just not familiar with them. Mm -hmm. um, and again, another example of technology uh, kind of having a role in, in the law, you dealt with the um, Smart SMR of New York versus uh, Fairlawn uh, Board of Adjustment case, which dealt with cell towers. Yes. So. And that was at a time when cell or mobile phone communication was not as common as it is today but it was common enough. And what we said there was that the test, at least in that case, for determining the propriety of the uh, construction of a cell tower was the test for a so-called special reasons variance under the, uh, the land use planning law. And we said that uh, they were sufficiently in the public interest to constitute a special reason, but that um, the, the proponent of the cell tower still had to uh, demonstrate that there was no adverse effect on adjoining properties or uh, properties in the neighborhood and on the zone plan. Uh, that that probably should be distinguished from another case that I wrote for the court called SICA versus the Board of Adjustment. And SICA involved a brain injury trauma institute. And that, uh, we said, uh, was a uh, sufficiently in the public interest that uh, that, that, that the town and that community should approve it. The, the case raised the, the so-called NIMBY issue, not in my backyard, where people recognize the need for a facility but don't want it in their, their neighborhood. And here we said that this, uh, this was sufficiently imbued with the public interest that, uh, uh, that it ought to be approved. Mm -hmm. um, I want to uh, leave the cases for a minute and talk a little bit about your administrative activities. Sure. Um, you served as chair of the Appellate Judges Conference of the uh, American Bar Association. Yes. When did that begin? Well, I served, it was right around 1990. Uh, before that, I'd been active in the Appellate Judges Conference. And I, I, and I, I was chair... I would guess in the late 80s or right around, right around 1990. And that, that was a fairly significant commitment. Uh, it involved, I went down and I testified before Congress, traveled around the country. Uh, I, th I, think, I think I'm the only person ever to have done that for the, uh, from the New Jersey court. But it, I liked it very much because it uh, permitted me to meet federal and state appellate judges f from outside New Jersey, and you, it kind of broadens your pers at least broadened for me my perspective to see how other people were addressing the same issues you had, and to to see how, how they functioned and so forth. An unfortunate consequence of that was I think I got myself sufficiently run down that I ended up taking some, I got a, some sort of virus, some sort of bug, ended up taking antibiotics, one of which, uh, to one of which I had an allergic reaction, mm. ended up with toxic hepatitis, yeah. which was no fun. Uh, and, uh, but I, I met an awful lot of wonderful people through that, and I think it did uh, broaden my perspective, and I hope made me a better judge. Do you remember any of the issues you had to deal with uh, during your, your <laughs> tenure there? 
No, I don't. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, I, I do remember one, and that I remember one dealt with the funding. There was a federal program for funding uh, criminal law projects, and there was some money in there for for the state for the state courts. And I remember going down to Washington and testifying before a congressional committee about that. Yeah. Uh, we, but one of the things the uh, the conference did was uh, sponsor continuing legal education programs for judges, and I had I had chaired the education committee before becoming chairman of the whole conference, and I <laughs> I think I probably. Uh, organized one of the least well-received programs. I had become interested in the relationship between law and economics primarily because we had a course in law and economics in the master's program at UVA. And so I organized a conference on that and uh, I think many, <laughs> many of the judges wished I had organized a conference about something else. Mm. Well, that, you had uh, been in the master's program, uh, I think you graduated in 88, is yes. that correct? Uh, so how did that come about? Well, that was, a, that was the best educational experience of my life. Uh, and uh, the program no longer exists at UVA. They closed it down, and it's now at Duke. But it was a two-year program. And you went down and spent, I think it was six or eight weeks uh, in the summer. And you would take regular law school courses from UVA faculty with blue book exams uh, write, and wrote a thesis. Uh, and I, what motivated me was I, I wanted to be the best justice I could be. And I began to think that maybe I ought to find out if I couldn't find some sort of matrix that would, uh, would help me see a connection as, it, as we went on the court from one case to another. And uh, so that's what, that's what we did. I, I, it was a fantastic program. Uh, and. Uh, I ended up writing a, my thesis on the uh, relationship between law, medicine, and bioethics, primarily because we had an evolving body of law here in New Jersey about that. We had the Quinlan right to die case. We had sequels to that on the court while I was there. We had case the Baby M case, which dealt with surrogacy. Uh, and again, I, I, was, I, was, I was starting to look for strands of connection as we went from one one case to another. And uh, uh, so that, that's, what, that, that's how that evolved. And I, I think uh, uh, one of the principles that came through to me incre with increasing clarity was, and I hope, it's, I hope it's reflected in some opinions, is the inherent dignity of every person uh, and uh, and I, I think that did resonate not only with judicial opinions, but I saw connections in in my life as I'd gone from one point to another. So that uh, that, that was that was a fantastic experience. Well, let, let me jump back into some uh, cases just to see how that may have played out in your um, opinions and your thoughts. Uh, there was Lantrigan versus uh, Celotex, which dealt with uh, uh, standards for scientific e mm. evidence. Did that what, one? Did do you see a connection between your your work and the master's program in that case, and and just in general? Can you tell us a little bit about that case? Um, I, I tell you, where I where I saw it more clearly was in the proportionality reviews on the death penalty cases. Okay. That, was, that was our final step in the 
appellate review of the imposition of a death penalty. And uh, one of the courses that we took at UVA was law and economics, and, and a component of that was an introduction to statistics. And I thought, well, at the time I was taking the course, I was wondering whether this was whether this would have any utility. And where it did help was in reviewing the uh, death the, the, the death penalty cases in the proportionality review, where what you do or what we what we did was we looked at the defendant before us and the relevant characteristics pertaining to that defendant and compare them with the characteristics of defendants in other cases who either had or had not received the death penalty to see whether this defendant was more like those who had not received it or more like those who had. And so the, the statistical analysis in that, uh, uh, in those cases, uh, uh, was helped immensely by having had that course at UVA. Yeah. Uh, Landrigan uh, involved the, the reliability of expert testimony, and it really, I think, it had something dealt more with something else. Okay. All right. Um, again, to stick with the cases, uh, can you tell me a little bit about the Schneider versus the American Association yes. of Blood Banks case? Well, that. That case uh, came out of the initial problem that society and therefore courts were having with the uh, uh, with AIDS and HIV and infected blood transfusions, and the uh, Mr. Snyder had I think he had had heart surgery. He needed a blood transfusion. Turns out the transfusion was HIV positive, and the issue was whether the American Association of Blood Banks owed him a duty. They they were not the ones who had provided the blood, but they were the ones who set the standards and uh, for, for for the blood banks and so forth, and. We said yes. There was a uh, such a duty, and that and that there was sufficient evidence that they had breached the duty to merit the case to go forward. Okay. Now, uh, again, to go back to uh, some of your administrative activities, um, you were involved in uh, the Seton Hall Health yes. Care Masters, which. I guess kind of plays along this theme. Um, yes. When did that begin? Uh, you were its first chairman. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but I would venture to say no, uh, roughly 10 years before I re retired. And I think by that time, uh, some folks were aware that I had an interest in the relationship between law, medicine, and bioethics. And two very wonderful faculty people from Seton Hall came out, Kathleen Buzang, who I believe is now the dean, uh, and John Jacoby, and asked me to, if I would chair the, a committee to get their health law program started, which I did for several years, right up until the time I retired. And uh, the, the, the program is now one of the, I think it's one of the best in the country. Uh, and uh, they've done a wonderful job with it. Hmm. What would your duties be as chairman? Uh, I, I know I ran the meetings of the committee, and John and Kathleen uh, would come out, and, and uh, either in person or on telephone, and we would talk about what, what should go into the curriculum, who should be invited for speakers, uh, all the th stuff that you would do if you were trying to start a, a program based on health law. Mm -hmm. um, and you also uh, remained heavily involved with uh, NYU Law School. Yes, yeah. I did. As I mentioned yesterday, 
Uh, I was on the board there of the law school and of the Institute of Judicial Administration. Mm -hmm. They nice. They were both UVA and NYU uh, invited me back to participate in their moot courts and to write articles and to give lectures. Uh, at UVA, uh, after I left the court, they invited me down to give a, a, a course uh, which was on law, medicine, and bioethics. Mm -hmm. uh, I think at NYU, I think I gave, I, I'm not so sure that, I, uh, the, that it was the best lecture they ever heard, <laughs> but it was probably the best one I ever gave. And it became the basis for a law review article on the art of judging, in which I tried to demonstrate that there, that artists and judges have experienced similarities in addressing their work. Well, I, you know, I've seen that uh, article in many versions and referred to often. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that philosophy that you try to get across? Well, uh, to be sure, there are differences between judges and uh, artists. I mean, <laughs> artists start with a creative impulse. Lawyers don't start until somebody files a lawsuit, or judges don't start until somebody files a lawsuit. Uh, but what I tried to do was l look, uh, generally speaking, at how both artists and judges are trying to make sense of human life and human interaction. Uh, the artist does it through, through painting and the judge does it through trying to adjust relationships in a judicial opinion. Mm. Now, was that, was that always your approach uh, or was that something that evolved during your tenure on the court? Well, I, I think the latter. Uh, I don't think I knew enough to have that when I started out. Uh, part of it, I think, may have come from the fact that my wife had a Master of Fine Arts. She loved to paint, and uh, so it was something we would talk about together from different perspectives. Now, you were also active in a number of Supreme Court committees, um, one of them, uh, the Professional Rules and Respons of Responsibility Committee. Can you talk a little bit about your work there? Well, we, we, we got into that a little bit yesterday, and that, that, that committee uh, looked at the uh, issues that arose under the rules of professional responsibility to see if it needed adjusting, fine-tuning. Uh, the, the larger enterprise was the Ethics 2000 revision. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I did chair some other committees. Uh, when, I, when I first went on the court, I chaired the Judicial Salary and Pensions Committee. Uh, and then I also, when I first went on the court, the court at that time did not have its own computer. We had time on the Attorney General's computer, which was not a good arrangement. And I remember at the, <laughs> at the conference where the issue arose, the Chief Justice said, no, I'd, I'd like someone to chair this committee. I was the new kid on the block, so the six other members who <laughs> didn't want to get anywhere near it looked down at the far end of the table, and I had nobody else to look to, so, so I ended up chairing that. Uh, and uh, I remember going out to uh, California to take a course given by IBM, which was sort of a uh, introduction course for the uninformed, to put it politely. And uh, then I remember we had a committee, uh, and one of the folks who was very helpful was the computer person out at Nabisco, which is here in Morris County. And he invited me out and showed me how their system worked. 
I remember when I was going out to one of the ABA meetings, I think it was in San Francisco, uh, for the appellate judges conference. Uh, I, w I went from that meeting up to Seattle to see the, uh, oh no, Olympia, Olympia, the mm -hmm. capital of Washington, because Washington had the most advanced uh, computer system among state courts, and they, they walked me through it. So I tried to, I tried to ac acquire enough knowledge so I could do the jobs, but I do the job, but I don't pretend to be an expert on computers at all. Hmm. Did, um, you know, particularly uh, examining the uh, Washington system, did you bring any of that back to New Jersey? Did they adopt oh, yes. anything that you found? Yes, yes. And then, then we, uh, the other thing we had to do was we had to find a director, uh, to find somebody who really knew what he or she was doing. And uh, as, as, I, as you go from one place to another, your names pop up. And so we, we, we conducted a search. And I remember the then administrative director and I, Bob Lipscher, interviewed several candidates and we ended up with a fellow who did a, did a good job until he retired. Um, but uh, yes, I think, I think going out to a place like Seattle and so forth uh, helped considerably. Hmm. Um, the uh, effects of drug cases on courts committee, when did that begin? Well, that was, that, the, the, what happened is, and I don't know if the court still does this, but it, it used to be that at, at the annual judi judicial conference, uh, there would be a program on a specific topic. Uh, and uh, the, Robert Wilentz asked me if I would chair a committee on the effect of drug cases on the court. And, and the problem was there, there was a revolving door. <coughs> I, I don't know to what extent it still exists, but it certainly was existing at that time where someone would be an addict, they'd be arrested, convicted, put into jail, released, arrested, convicted. So they would, there was this revolving door and our committee came up with the astonishing suggestion that maybe instead of simply incarcerating these people, we ought to try to give them some drug treatment. Mm. And I, I think uh, that has since been implemented. I, again, I've lost track of the issue, so I don't know how it's, how it's moving. But uh, uh, that, w that was a good committee. We had, we had prosecutors. We had public defenders, we had academicians, we had members of the public on it, and uh, I, think we, I think we did some good work. Mm. Uh, was there, you know, general consent on that idea of getting help, or was, you know, was it a tough sell to some sectors? Yeah, no, the, I think, I think there w were some dissenting views. Uh, But uh, my understanding is that the, uh, there's been increasing re awareness of the need for that sort of thing. So I think we were on the right track. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did the um, uh, committee also look at um, intersecting issues of race and, and uh, economics? No, not okay. that I recall, not that I recall.